from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Well, we're back on the road for our 2022 U.S. Farm Report College Road Show with Bex. And this week, we're in fighting Illini country. And here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. Soybean prices shot up this week after a bullish USDA report. The market reacted initially pretty, a uh, pretty big move, and we've given back a lot of that here in the last 24 hours. And kind of the question is sort of, you know, how does that fit in with the overall global supply and demand picture? What well, University of Illinois economists are watching as harvest picks up pace. The farm of the future planted in these soils here in Illinois. Our economic model suggests that we should be able to do this well under $10 an acre for the whole team of robots. And a possible solution in soybeans to fighting world hunger. Only now we are seeing like that we can really still modify it and get increases in yield, I think. Plus, in John's world. My verdict on Starlink. The 2022 U.S. Farm Report College Roadshow from the University of Illinois is brought to you exclusively by Bex. From farmers' first pass in the field to the final one at harvest, it's a game plan rooted in faith and belief. Bex Hybrids is with you every turn because both on and off the field, we're all farmers at heart. See why at BexHybrids.com. Well, now for the news. USDA's latest supply and demand report makes major revisions to yield, especially to soybeans this week. USDA putting bean yields at 49.8 bushels to the acre. That's down 7 tenths from September, and that means a cut in production. The numbers lower than the trade had actually anticipated heading into the report. Corn falling more in line. The new yield almost 172 bushels to the acre, down almost a half a bushel from September. And as for wheat, USDA taking another bushel off of the wheat yield now at 46 and a half bushels per acre. Well, USDA also cut exports for all three corn, soybeans and wheat, leaving ending stocks unchanged for soybeans. But corn ending stocks were a bit higher than the trade had expected, even while cutting by 47 million bushels. Wheat stocks, on the other hand, also a little higher than anticipated. USDA saying specifically about wheat that due to slow pace of export sales and continued uncompetitive U.S. export prices, this would be the lowest U.S. wheat exports since 1971. We'll take a deeper dive into these numbers coming up in our roundtable discussion. Well, we also received a new crop production numbers when it comes to the orange production from USDA. The agency saying survey work on the Florida citrus forecast was completed before Hurricane Ian tore through Florida, but the news already is not good for many producers. USDA pegging the all orange forecast at 3.9 million tons. That's down 8% from last year. Zeroing in on Florida, it's forecast to produce 28 million boxes of oranges. That's down a whopping 32% from last season. Early, mid-season and naval varieties in the state are forecast at 11 million boxes. That's down 40%. The Florida Valencia orange forecast is estimated at 17 million boxes, down 25%. Forecasters say that we really won't know the impact of the hurricane until the next citrus forecast in early December. Inflation in the U.S. accelerated in September with the cost of housing and other necessities intensifying. Consumer prices rose 8.2 percent in September compared with a year earlier, according to the government. On month to month basis, prices increased four tenths of a percent from August to September. In just one year from September of last year to this past September, food prices have increased more than 11 percent. Overall, the CPI was higher than what analysts expected. Well, a labor strike remains a possibility again for U.S. railroads. That's after the third largest railroad union rejected a tentative agreement this week. More than half of the 23,000 members of the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees Division Union opposed the agreement. You'll remember the last minute tentative agreement was struck just before a September 16th deadline and had the support of the White House. But union leaders argue the railroads did not do enough to address worker concerns, specifically working conditions as well as paid time off. Now both sides will need to return to the bargaining table to avoid a possible strike once again, but a strike can't happen until at least November 19th, according to the union. Major railroads carry 30% of the nation's freight. A strike could cause shortages and higher prices for essentials that are already high, like food and gas. 
Well, low water levels on the Mississippi River are also causing issues for U.S. exports right now. USDA says U.S. crop exports at Louisiana Gulf Coast terminals are at their lowest levels in nine years for the first week of the month. It comes at a time when exports usually pick up pace. Forecasters say just over 976,000 tons of corn, soybeans and wheat were inspected for exports at the Mississippi River Gulf Coast. That's down 22 percent from the previous five year average. Below water levels due to drought aren't just an issue on the Mississippi. There's also problems on the Ohio River. Take a look at these photos of the Mound City landing along the Ohio River. That's not far from where the Ohio and Mississippi rivers converge. Just look at how low those water levels are. American Commercial Barge Lines reports the Ohio River is currently closed at River Mile 974. It's due to a barge grounding at the Olmstead Lock and Dam. Well, farmland is still selling for record amounts. Take the latest case in Iowa. In Plymouth County, a local farmer reportedly bought this land for $26,250 an acre. Bidding had started at $17,000. Jim Rothermich of Iowa Appraisal says he confirmed the sale price was no influence from development or wind energy and that it's based on the production of both corn and soybeans. He says it's the highest price he knows of in the state and in Plymouth County. The last record, well, that was just set back in August when property in Sioux County went for $26,000 an acre. Wow, those prices just keep climbing. All right, that's it for the news. Well, when we come back, parts of Illinois did see some rain this weekend, but it may not keep farmers out of the field for very long. We'll have a check of your forecast coming up next. Your next piece of equipment is on machinerypeat.com. Search equipment from dealerships across the country to find what you're looking for. Only on machinerypeat.com. Time now for a check of weather with meteorologist Matt Urasavik. Matt, the forecast taking a sharp turn this weekend, much cooler this week. But in talking to farmers here in Illinois, Matt, it's been a slow harvest this year, but due to the crop not drying down quickly, it's not because of wet weather. Does that dry spell continue next week? Yeah, Ty, and that is right. We've got drier conditions on tap, and that's going to continue through this week. Not a lot of rain expected right through the middle part of the country. You can see uh, the root zone here extremely dry from the Dakotas all the way down into Texas, and we've been dealing with the dry conditions back in the west for most of the summer season and now into the fall. We've seen some more rain here in parts of New Mexico and Arizona. That keeps things a little damp there, but things are really starting to dry out in the east again through the mid south and then into the northeast also. So expecting drought conditions could expand in the east as we head through next week. But here's a look at that drought monitor right now. As of October 13th, we've got expanding drought conditions through the Great Lakes, the mid south down into the southeast, and we've got increasing drought here in the center part of the country where we've got Kansas and Oklahoma under the extreme to exceptional drought conditions that continues back in Utah, parts of Nevada and central parts of California. California there, including the San Joaquin Valley. So definitely something we'll keep an eye on here. Again, I know we are getting into that harvest season for harvest in full swing for most of the country and slowly starting to come to an end where it is getting cooler. But yeah, take a look at that. A very dry conditions through the middle part of the country. We are in that fall season, the battle of warmer air to the south, cooler air to the north. You can see that here on Monday, much cooler air coming into the Great Lakes and even maybe some snowflakes mixing in with some lake enhanced rain showers there even heading into Tuesday as you can see that cooler air dipping farther into the Ohio Valley and the Northeast staying warmer in the West with the big ridge out that way the cooler air will eventually kind of remove itself from the United States back up into Canada but it's not going to get all too warm next week we're going to be talking about temperatures at least in the northern tier below average and still warmer in the south but it looks like a more zonal pattern setting up as we head into next weekend which could quiet things down just a little bit high pressure in the center of the country. We've got a front exiting down to the south. Some showers across Texas and New Mexico along the Gulf Coast as well. And then more showers with another storm system moving eastward. Chilly behind the front, but warmer out ahead of it. Parts of Florida and uh, parts of the West Coast dealing with warmer conditions there. And then we don't have much going on as we head into Wednesday. A few lake enhanced rain showers, maybe mixing in with a few snowflakes there. Chillier across the north, warmer in the south. Lots of sunshine with high pressure and control of most of the country. A little bit of a warm front here, but doesn't really have precipitation along with it. Just some cloud cover moving its way on through. And then on Friday, system trying to form in a uh, parts of the northeast. 
may mix in some snow showers there. Cold on the backside of the front and then another system moving in to the southwest, which could bring a few rain showers down that way. So much below normal in the east, much above normal in the west with regards to temperatures. And then most of the country dealing with below normal precipitation as we head through this week. Time back to you. Thanks, Matt. Well, as we mentioned, the USDA report this week was definitely a market mover. So what do you need to keep an eye on as harvest pace picks up? We have Matt Bennett as well as two University of Illinois economists that join us next. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend here from the University of Illinois. Thanks to Bex. A great panel joining us with a mix of economists as well as a market analyst and, and, and farmer. So, Joe, let's start off by talking about this USDA report this week. Quite a response in, in, in soybeans. What spurred soybean prices to surge higher after that USDA report? Well, I guess a, a bigger uh, adjustment to that yield number, yield uh, national soybean yield down. Um, more than more than maybe people expected. Uh, now the market reacted initially pretty a uh, pretty big move, and we've given back a lot of that here in the last 24 hours. And kind of the question is sort of you know how does that fit in with the overall global supply and demand picture? We've also seen you know news about big crops elsewhere in the world. So because uh, to some extent we've, we've built in a lot of the downward pressure on on prices uh, or upward pressure on prices with lower yields. Um, now what do, what do we do from here? Yeah, yeah. Matt, uh, you know, we'll get your take on the report, but right now you're in the field, you're harvesting, you're going to leave here and get in the combine. Uh, soybean yields, you know, talking to some farmers, it's been a little surprising how good some of those yields are for the or earlier planted soybeans. Do you think that that will continue as they get into some of these later planted soybeans as well, Matt? That's a really good question. I would say that just the anecdotal stuff that we've heard, a lot of the producers we work with throughout the uh, uh, throughout the U.S. basically are saying the earliest planted beans for them have been the best. The earliest harvested beans have actually performed the best as well for a lot of these producers. So, you know, I've got to think that as you move through harvest, you might see, I mean, this 0.7 bushel drop, I guess, wasn't a huge shock to me based upon everything I've heard over the last week. If you'd asked me two weeks ago, I might have told you the yield was actually going to be a little bit higher. So uh, yesterday's didn't necessarily surprise me just because of what we've been here in the last several days. Well, Scott, some of the analysts we've talked to lately, I mean, corn, pretty good in some areas. I know there were some dry spots here in Illinois. We saw dry spots in the in the western corn belt, of course, that was definitely advertised this summer. But it's got some analysts saying, listen, could we see USDA actually raise yields? When you see what USDA does typically from the October report to the next report, do you think there's more chances we see another reduction or could we see them actually increase yields here on out? I think that we're probably really close to in range of the final U.S. average corn yield is what I think. You know, uh, basically the story's been uh, in some of the western Corn Belt states like um, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, you know, that drought out there just really hit them hard. Um, and I still think that probably one of the more interesting parts of the report is, and what we know now, is just how good Illinois corn and soybean yields are. Uh, it's really uh, interesting to me. The weather was decent in some parts of yeah. Illinois this summer, but not fantastic. And in places like here around Champaign, it was you know downright terrible. And we're still just going to have a fantastic crop. So uh, yeah. a great testament to the farmers of Illinois. And a, a testament to those early planted soybeans, what yields you could get. <laughs> Sometimes 20, 30 bushel better is what I'm hearing for some of those beans that were planted early. But Joe, when you look, I mean, at the markets right now, the supply situation, that story isn't over. We're going to continue to watch that as we then head into the final report in January. But what do you think is the biggest thing that traders and the market is watching right now? Brazil production is is it. Um, we're moving into their into their main production season. We get a lot of news and it, and that kind of that news doesn't sort of all hit up front. It kind of plays itself out more slowly over time relative to what we see here in the U.S. typically. <clears throat> So uh, I, I keep watching that. The projections are for a, a record crop up 20% roughly over what we saw a year ago, which was a down year for Brazil. Now, if that crop comes in bigger, if we get big yields down there too, uh, that, that changes the global supply and demand balance in a big way. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about Brazil coming up. But Matt, when you look at the price levels that we're at today, even with, when we see this volatility, can you get much more bullish than what we're, we've already seen? Well, you know, I think a fashionable thing to do for producers over the last 
few years, but especially the last couple of years, has been sell out of the field and then reown your crop. And so you have to ask yourself, uh, do you want to reown at fourteen dollars, and do you want to own it pushing seven dollars? And that's a valid question. I think a lot of producers sold in advance, have some stuff contracted at really good price levels, but what you take to town, you have to make a decision: are you going to sell, or are you going to store? And I think for most producers, uh, the easy easy answer for me is to go ahead and lock a price in. Yeah. And if you want to reown it, there's so many tools you can use. But let's not try to overcomplicate things. We're looking at historically high price levels already. I'm not saying that I don't think we can go higher, but uh, locking in a, a good thing sometimes is the best way to go. All right. Well, we have a lot more to talk about. But first, we need to take a quick break, and then we'll have much more right here on U.S. Farm Report. <laughs> Well, USDA recently rolled out more announcements about helping boost broadband in rural areas, but for many in remote areas of the country, millions of dollars of investment hasn't fixed the internet issues. But is Starlink the answer? John Phipps gives us his review. Now, some of you with sharp eyes noticed last week that my Starlink equipment had arrived after only 19 months. It took me a while to get around to it, but this week I installed the receiver. I put mine on my roof for maximum clearance and less chance of hitting it with a lawnmower or a falling branch. The instructions are IKEA simple, just a diagram. Mount or place the antenna receiver in a clear sp overhead space. The phone out download will help you select such a good location. Plug the receiver into the router and plug the router into the power. The app walks you through the setup and initialization. It takes about 30 minutes to get it up and running, at least did, did, did for me. Uh, a couple of points. They include a clever carrying bag that's useful if you're mounting it above ground and you have to climb with it. But the bag doesn't work well if you carry it upside down so that the thing can fall out. So the small dark spot you see on one corner is an epoxy tank repair to fix that broken corner when I dropped it on a sidewalk. It's working, so obviously it's farmer proof. Also, the roof mount is like a patio umbrella and allowed too much rotational slop in my judgment. So I drilled a hole through the diameter and bolted both tubes together firmly. If you've been watching closely all this time, you could have seen it adjust to the satellites in real time. I've killed about two hours doing that. Now, as for performance, the jury's still out. Depending on the time of day, 6 to 10 p.m. in the evening being the worst, my downloading speed is anywhere from 8 to 80 megabits per second. Here are some speed test screenshots at various times of day. Downloading is the important number for streaming, which I think is the obvious future of television. If you have a really big 4K TV, you need really about 15 megabits. Uploading speeds are, well, just sad. Unless you are gaming or uploading TikTok or YouTube video, this poor speed may not be that big a deal breaker. But the latency, that's the ping times, are very poor as well, at least mine have been, which is also bad news for gamers. Neighbors who have had their Starlinks for a while have had better results and tell me that it will get better. Of course, more satellites will be launched and coverage will be improved and also speed. Right now, though, Starlink is underperforming my local ISP in some ways, especially uploading. They also bumped the price to $110 a month while starting to weasel about performance expectations. Okay, the bottom line is Starlink is a godsend for farmers with poor or no broadband access, streaming speed, or otherwise. But it's still a work in progress with capacity and coverage issues that may need to be approved for many areas. Very interesting. Thanks, John. Well, when we come back, Machinery Pete, he has tractor tails from just down the road. Stay with us. Welcome back to Tractor Tales, folks. This week, we've got a classic 1964 John Deere 4020 working the fields of central Indiana. We just play with it, pull some with it, and I love going to plow days. I farm a little, yeah. We disc and, and plow and, and get the ground ready. It was a lot like you see it now. Played with the motor a little bit and, and some tires and, and cleaned it up. It pulls kind of hard, but once you get the plow on the ground, it does a pretty good job. We do parades, we do plow days, a uh, few tractor rides. I'd rather go to a plow day than, than any of them, but. Why is that? 
I don't know. You see, you meet so many people from all over. There's a guy here from from Ohio. You know, I would never, never meet somebody like that. Yeah. They're just so smooth, so easy to to run. They're comfortable. But back in '64, that was that was a really nice tractor. Thanks so much, Greg. Well, when we come back, research here at the University of Illinois may have uncovered a key ingredient in not just boosting soybean yields here in the U.S., but around the world. We'll head out to the farm from right here at the University of Illinois next as our U.S. Farm Report College Roadshow continues. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report, trusted, timely, tradition. Welcome back to our U.S. Farm Report College Roadshow, thanks to VEX. Well, the most recent report from the United Nations showed that in 2021, nearly 10% of the world population was hungry. And with global grain concerns with the crisis in Ukraine, that number is expected to grow. But research right here at the University of Illinois may have uncovered a global solution in soybeans. Ending world hunger may sound like a dream, but these researchers are making great strides in turning that wish into a reality. Photosynthesis is something that um, has been studied like for so long time, you know, and only now we are seeing like that we can really still modify it and get increases in yield. Led by these researchers at the University of Illinois, they have proof that improving photosynthesis in major crops just may be the key to growing yields around the globe. We have discovered three different ways in which we can enhance photosynthesis that is resulting in improved productivity in the field. The research already has a track record nearly a decade long, thanks to a project called Realizing Increased Photosynthetic Efficiency, otherwise known as RIPE. First of all, to increase the ability of the plant to produce the chemical which captures carbon dioxide. The second one is that plants also absorb oxygen in photosynthesis at the same time as CO2. But the third piece is also where University of Illinois researchers led the charge thanks to the power of genetic engineering. Other people started to test like which genes would be suitable to improve that step. And then we came up with three different genes, which is what we call the V, P and Z genes, which stand for like it's initial for like three different enzymes in the pigment cycle and in all the plants. She says the team then overexpressed those three genes in an effort to improve photosynthesis. So we are adding more protein of those three different enzymes that makes the plant, you know, deal faster with uh, changes in, in fluctuations in light. Tobacco and soybeans have been the spotlight of the research so far, but now the team is digging into crops like corn, rice, cowpea, and cassava. Now, of course, we need, you know, to expand the, that research and, and do um, multi-location trials where we are going to test different environments and different locations and see if that is consistent across the states or across like other uh, countries as well. Then, of course, when you've completed deregulation, you've got to put this into the right background for the right geography and scale it up. So realistically, you're looking at 15 to 20 years. While the findings could still be another two decades before hitting farmers' fields, it's uncovering a growing need, producing higher yields without consuming more land. It's also about using maybe less water per carbon that you assimilate. And when we think that we can produce more uh, in the same space of land that we have, it is sustainability. We are not using more land for, for producing more. These researchers know what they're uncovering could be a game changer for agriculture around the globe. A rewarding finding rooted in a passion to answer a global need, ending world hunger. Well, RIPE, which is the International Research Project, it's supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research, as well as others. Well, when we come back, we'll talk more about that demand with economists Dan Matt Bennett. Our marketing roundtables pick back up right after the break.
Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Well, great marketing discussion so far. A lot more to talk about. Uh, but, but Scott, basis real quick. You know, we thought this, this rail situation, uh, maybe we had this resolved, but this week we did see the third largest union in the country mm -hmm. vote against uh, what was the, 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 the tentative agreement that had the backing of the White House. So a rail strike is back on. We know issues are not resolved with low river levels along the Mississippi River. When you look at basis, especially in the Eastern Corn Belt, how much risk is there? I think you could say that there's considerable risk. I mean, the basis is already adjusting to those possibilities right now. I mean, you look at the weather forecast, uh, I don't think that uh, anytime soon the low uh, Mississippi water levels are going to be solved. So I think we're probably looking uh, until e both of those get resolved uh, till we get back to a little bit uh, stronger basis levels that would be consistent with the sh shorter crops that we have. No. You know, I think the migration of corn from the east to the west is going to be quite a dynamic that we're going to see this year. Uh, one thing about the rail situation is that if the river levels weren't so low, you know, would that have been accepted potentially? I think they're sitting in the driver's seat, quite frankly. Absolutely. I don't want to speak for them. But the bottom line right now is that you can't float a barge down the Mississippi River or up. And so you think about fertilizer as well. There's right. two different things you're talking about. And when you can't float a full barge one way or the other, it, it takes your efficiencies drastically lower. And so I think that your basis early on was going to be the strongest basis you'd see for quite some time. I'd agree with Scott. I think that if you want to see basis better than that later on, the potential is there, but you're going to have to be quite patient to see that later on in the year. Well, it seems like these unions are in the driver's seat, not just because of issues with water, but also heading up into to midterm elections. We have CPI, Consumer Price Index, that came out. Scott, what is your view right now on inflation? We have USDA, their forecast of inflation, not as high as what we're, we're seeing in some of the, these, these uh, reports that are coming out. Do you think that this continues to just fuel rate hikes in, in the near future? I think today's CPI report really puts the, the nail in that one that uh, there's really going to be no hope for um, a tapering by the Fed in the first half of 2023, which the, the stock and financial markets have had put some faith in. That I don't think that that's going to happen. We're, we're just right now stuck in kind of a round of 8% year-over-year inflation environment. And until we see significant movement off of that, I don't think the Fed's going to budge which is not good for the economy here in the short run as we head into 2023. But it's not just like the U.S. is the only country right now facing inflation. You look at Europe, you look at some of these other countries, yet we have this U.S. dollar that is, you know, is just strong compared to, to other currencies. So, Joe, when you look at export demand, is it recession fear or demand in general? Is it recession fears? Is it inflation? Um, or is it, is, is it the strong dollar that you think poses the biggest risk? Um, all of those, I, I think the, the currency thing I see as a, really a short run thing. When, when we see big moves in currency markets, uh, it changes people's expectations. And that uh, relates to the inflation story as well, right? It's when people's expectations change, we get big dislocations in the economy. And that kind of can kind of jam up the works in terms of export demand, like you mentioned. Well, we, we have seen demand hold fairly strong, not only in the in the, the grain side, but we've seen on the livestock side, we've seen the demand not taper, even with concerns of a recession and people cutting back. So Matt, in your mind, what is the biggest risk do you think with demand overall right now when you look at commodities as a whole? Well, I think one thing we've already slashed a fair amount of demand out of the balance sheet. So we have to keep in mind, you know, you've slashed over half a billion bushels of demand out of this corn balance sheet. Now, is some of this warranted? Did $8 corn do its job? Well, I think you have to make the argument that, yeah, absolutely it does. And so high prices cure high prices. But what is the biggest risk for me is probably going to be this export situation. Now, if the Black Sea region can't put corn on the market, I think U.S. exports will probably overperform. But if they can, I think you could be looking at a further reduction in U.S. corn exports. Scott, last weekend on the show, Dan Bossi said we think that oil will go back to $100. When you look at oil prices, when you look at gasoline prices, and the impact typically that high oil prices has on, on ethanol demand, typically it is good. What is your view on gasoline and ethanol demand at this point, Scott? Well, that's a function of the overall economic situation in addition to the price of crude oil and gasoline but we've got pretty clear trends that are going on on the use side you know we've been down between roughly five and ten percent uh, on 
gasoline use here in the U.S. Uh, for the last six months almost. And so as we go into the next year, I think that uh, that's the environment that we're looking at for E10 gasoline use, which of course ethanol is 10% of that. So I think we've still got some further weakness on the corn balance sheet coming on the uh, ethanol number as we go through the 22-23 marketing year. All right, well, we appreciate you all being here. Good luck this weekend against the Gophers. And as a Mizzou grad, I, I actually mean that, okay? Good luck, good luck this weekend against the Gophers. Thanks for joining us. All right, we've been showcasing some of the amazing research here at the University of Illinois, but we need to take a quick break and then we'll have much more of that when we come back. Well, as we heard at World Dairy Expo last week, even with food inflation and talk of a recession, dairy demand has held surprisingly strong. But one researcher here at the University of Illinois is uncovering a key ingredient to keeping dairy cows healthy and happy. Walk inside this freestyle barn. The special thing is that we need to know how much each cow is eating every day. And you'll quickly see it's not your typical dairy. So we call that individual dry matter intake. We need to know how much each cow is doing that. With a transmitter device attached to each cow's neck, the technology is connected to the gate. So we call that the Callan gate system, right? So we get that from a company. And that transmitter for that cow will only open one gate. So we know that everything that's coming out of here, it's from her. Phil Cardasso specializes in serving up research that caters to dairy farmers' specific needs. The goal of the research is try to understand how amino acids work in the dairy cow. He says considering every mammal like cattle need protein, those proteins are produced off amino acids. We know that when we feed cows, especially here in the Midwest with the types of feeds that we, we have, that some amino acids, right, they are going to be limiting. So that means I can have all the other amino acids. If I don't have all of them, then I'm going to limit the cow in, for example, milk protein yield. Knowing that amino acids are essential for boosting dairy production, research here is revealing rumen and protected lysine could also benefit dairy cattle in other ways. One of the ways and one of the objects of the research is how do you better feed those amino acids? It's a very intricate uh, uh, product that needs to be protected from the rumen so the, all the bugs in that rumen doesn't use the amino acid and goes straight to the adenum so the cow can then uh, be able to absorb that amino acid. As researchers explore how producers can better feed that amino acid, the focus is now on lysine. There's very little research out there on lysine and what we want to do is that how modulating that amount of lysine will impact the cow's health, the cow's fertility, and also the cow's performance. What we are revealing with this research is that that amino acid is not only important for milk protein synthesis, but also for the cow's fertility. It's not just how much is added to the feed ration, but when. That's what we've done in the research is feed four weeks before and four weeks after calving, so we can see if we could alleviate and improve the whole fertility and the whole system that make that transition a little bit more smooth. So what we saw was that if we fed the lysine product before and after calving, that the uterus of those cows, they were in a better situation. Good nutrition is vital in helping dairy cattle churn out milk efficiently and effectively. And University of Illinois could help dairy producers fine tune their recipe for years to come. Dairy farms are one of those that have seen consolidation take place. John has a viewer's question about farm size next. Are too many farmers farming too many acres? Well, it's a question that comes in from time to time. It's about farm size. John Phipps answers a viewer's question this weekend in customer support. From Daniel C. Schmidt in Belle Plaine, Minnesota, all across America, we see bakeries, restaurants, small dairies, hardware stores, and smaller cash crop farms selling out. Here is my question. 
would it not be better for America to have 10 1,000 acre growers versus t one 10,000 acre grower? Many will tell you we have no stops in place for when is big too big. Some tell me we should have maxed out tractor horsepower at 200. Surely there must be some controls that are necessary. I don't want socialism either, but should we be talking about trying to incentivize growers under some acreage amount? Maybe it's 5,000 acres. Well, thank you for writing. Your concern is shared by many others. The USDA has a wealth of numbers on farm size, but some are less helpful than others. For example, the average farm size, now remember a farm's defined by $1,000 in gross income, has been virtually unchanged during my lifetime, even though, like you, I have watched as farms have grown from hundreds to thousands of acres. The instinctive reaction is to judge large farmers as, well, greedy, taking land from a fixed quantity of acres so there are less for others. That's not necessarily true. For one thing, there are more farmers wanting to farm than we actually need. This has been the case, at least around here, since the Great Depression. That was the last time tillable ground ever went unplanted for lack of farmer interest. Technology constantly lowers the labor needed per acre. But the most important factor is to remember that farmers are selected by land owners, not strictly by merit or fairness. We have very large farms because large or larger numbers of landowners rent their ground to them. I don't want to, I don't see or I support any way to interfere with that right of ownership. Farmers themselves own 60% of all farmland, but there is a pattern of very successful farmers building large operations which then tend to divide off at succession. Large farm operations have significant churn. They are always there but not always the same ones. Other countries have had some success moderating farm size by limiting ownership to farmers, but then you have to qualify who is a farmer. We may be pushing some physical limits, however, like transit inefficiency, machinery and field size mismatches, and management capacity that will at least counter farm growth rates. In all, it's hard to find agreement on what would be a better solution or the perfect farm size. Thanks, John. And remember, if you want to see more of John's commentary, just use that QR code that's on your screen. All right, when we come back, the future of farming may already be here in Illinois. We'll give you a glimpse next. Well, when you think about the farm of the future, what comes to mind? Maybe robots planting and harvesting crops, a driverless tractor sprawling out across farm after farm. Well, here at the University of Illinois, the farm of the future may be closer than you think. This is, this is 40 acres here, what we call the digital trial. And on the other side is another 40 acres, what, which, is, which is the conventional trial. This University of Illinois farmland is home to something truly unique. This is the site for the farm of the future, which is the only such site sponsored by NIFA USDA across the country. The Illinois Farming and Regenerative Management Testbed, or iFarm for short, is growing thanks to a three-year grant. The farm of the future is a testbed for a number of emerging and promising technologies to be evaluated and brought to market, brought to farmers so that they can be more sustainable and more profitable. The USDA NIFA grant this year awarded the university $3.9 million for the farm of the future. The USDA is looking at, uh, you know, what technologies hold promise. Uh, they're, they're looking to basically make American agriculture the leading force. The campus-wide effort is planted with a strong vision and one that makes row crops and animal agriculture even more integrated. So we've had a number of these robots go through these fields and plant this cover crop. But we have managed to plant all the 40 acres uh, now with these robots. So it's a huge step. It's a contiguous uh, land. It's like, it, you know, it may, for in view of the 200 million acres, it looks like a small step. But for agrobotics, it's a huge leap forward. Economic data shows the cost to plant cover crops today is around $20 per acre. Our economic model suggests that we should be able to do this well under $10 an acre uh, for the whole team of robots. And we can do it all the way from July to October. 
By measuring what's happening in the soil and teaming that up with the satellite and ground data, all of the data is being combed through to see how it can help animal agriculture as well. And then also looking into the barriers of adopting some of these technologies in use today. We hope that the cover crop planting, enabling cover crop planting at scale with lower cost with this new technology would be a big uh, step forward in terms of bringing more digital technologies to ag in an integrated way. The farm of the future hasn't been flawless. Planting with robots has come with challenges. We're looking at a vision of five of these robots driving at three miles an hour, covering 80 acres in about five hours. And the way they do it is that they go through one row and they broadcast seeds to that row and two, one row on each side. So three rows at a time. So we feel that if we can do cover crops at some reasonable scale with this project, that would be a big step forward for digital agriculture. From working to propel the speed of the robots to making it easier for farmers to manage multiple robots in the field at once, the farm of the future is truly focused on farmers. Well, a big thank you to the University of Illinois for hosting us for our 2022 College of Roadshow with Vex. We're back in the studio next week. Then we will wrap up this year's Roadshow from K-State followed by Mizzou. A busy few weeks, but we hope that you'll join us as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.